Welcome back to another Mojo Action News Behind the Drought exclusive, where we dig into the reasons behind our growing water shortage other than the drought itself. We're going to continue the second installment of the series by leaving our base camp in Nevada and following the Colorado River upstream. Here, straddling the upper and lower basin states of Arizona and Utah, lies Lake Powell, a reservoir established through the construction of the Glen Canyon Dam in 1964. Outflow from the upper basin states, including Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming, is retained in Lake Powell. In the current day, the lake is often held as essential for recreation, generating hydropower, and of course, passing that water on to the lower basin states of Arizona, California, and Nevada, and then on into Mexico. Powell is the second biggest artificial lake in the U.S., only behind its older cousin Lake Mead downstream. It has a maximum storage capacity of 26 million acre-feet, which is roughly two years' worth of typical Colorado River flows. To meet delivery responsibilities to the lower basin, the upper basin uses Lake Powell as a holding bank, storing the Colorado spring floods for later release. Growing populations in the southwest required more water and power, so the Glen Canyon Dam was approved and built to harness the power of the Colorado and also to help fund future federal endeavors in the region. In times of drought, theoretically, the retained water could then be released to sustain demands of the population and help cities overcome dry spells. In practice, however, this plan is seemingly falling apart, a casualty of flawed data, overuse, and a bit of poor engineering, the roots of which we hope to explore in this video. Work began at the site in October 1956, with the first dynamite charges beginning to open two diversion tunnels, which would soon carry the flow of the mighty Colorado. The lower reaches of these diversion tunnels would later be made into the permanent dam spillways. This design, unfortunately, would later introduce a weak point in the spillways that would need repairs a short time later. More on that soon. The porous Navajo sandstone also created some major problems for the construction and excavation crews right from the get-go. The loose, unstable rock matrix continually slabbed off and created many dangerous cave-ins. Work progressed slowly, and the material dug out of the tunnels was eventually used to build two opposing coffer dams, which would reroute the Colorado River into the new diversion tunnels. On a chilly winter day in February 1959, while the Colorado was subdued and awaiting its spring melts, the right side diversion was finally opened. The coffer dam was in place and the mighty Colorado was now struck off its natural course. Work could then finally begin on the canyon floor. The remote construction site literally had no roads to it. A new access bridge had to be built to span the canyon, later called the Glen Canyon Bridge, and a new town was built ground up for the workers named Page. Despite an initial strike over wages by the construction workers, concrete started pouring in June 1960. Block by block, segment by segment, the mighty concrete structure rose from its sandstone bed. Nearby in the town of Flagstaff, workers were busy fabricating 100-ton steel penstocks, the pipes that would connect the water intake to the hydropower turbines. Seven years after beginning this colossal mega dam, and 5 million cubic yards of concrete later, the Glen Canyon Dam was topped off on September 13, 1963, standing at a total height of 710 feet, just short of its elder the Hoover Dam which stands at 726. Construction came at the cost of 18 lives and countless other injuries, but no workers were buried in concrete as is a common myth with these structures. Almost immediately after the dam was finished, the Colorado River began to back up and rise behind the impressive structure, though the massive Glen Canyon wouldn't fill to capacity until June 20th, 1980, when it reached full pool at 3,700 feet above sea level. It was three years after dam construction was completed in 1966 that the name Lake Powell was officially designated in honor of John Wesley Powell, a geologist and veteran of the American Civil War. Powell was one of the first to command and document an expedition in wooden boats through the Grand Canyon, leaving from Wyoming in May 1869. It took three months for Powell to complete the journey and exit the west mouth of the canyon near the current day area of Temple Bar Marina, where the Colorado and Virgin Rivers meet. During the trip, four of the ten men abandoned the expedition due to a series of hardships, including the loss of boats, near drownings, 
and running low on provisions. Meanwhile, Powell himself successfully completed the arduous journey with only one arm, having lost the other during the Civil War. And despite all of this, his meticulous note-taking, surveys, barometric readings, and geological observations helped map out the last uncharted spaces in the United States. Powell would later plan a second Grand Canyon expedition two years later in 1871, and eventually go on to become the second director of the United States Geological Survey. He would recall in his diary as the area of Glen Canyon having wonderful features. Carved walls, royal arches, glens, alcove gulches, mounds, and monuments. In his time, Powell was a proponent of the federal government planning and controlling water supply in the West, a task he thought was too big for individual states to handle. But he would later oppose how they went about it, especially in regards to water rights, state boundaries, and the river compact. He believed that the state borders out west should have been drawn more closely around watersheds, resembling the borders on the map here, with the water and its usage remaining its own region. Instead, the federal government at the time hastily drew up the rest of the western map without much thought at all. In contrast to the east at the time, where states like Ohio followed the jagged path of the Ohio River, and the great Mississippi itself drew borders along five states, western states like Wyoming and Colorado were just squares, despite the latter being divided by the Rocky Mountains and the Colorado River. In 1893, at a western irrigation conference, much like the one we just saw in December 2022, Powell declared to attendees, I tell you, gentlemen, you are piling up a heritage of conflict and litigation over water rights, for there is not sufficient water to supply these lands. With the current river compact disagreement between the states in 2023, no deal. it now seems John Wesley Powell had infinite foresight into the matter, as he was convinced early on that uncontrolled development of western land by this design would have disastrous results. Prior to constructing the dam and flooding Glen Canyon, the seemingly endless side canyons and tributaries each had a rich history left behind by ancient tribes, Spanish explorers, Mormon pioneers, and some enterprising prospectors. Not only did flooding the canyon impact its ancient archaeology, but several other important modern historical sites were also submerged as the Colorado River backed up to fill Lake Powell. One such location, known as the Crossing of the Fathers, was where two Catholic priests journeying to California in 1776 safely passed across the tumultuous Colorado at a natural ford. Nearly a century later, John Wesley Powell stopped at this exact location on his voyage in 1869 because it offered his group a calm resting place after navigating the perilous rapids of the area. From which of these features shall we select a name, Powell penned? We decide to call it Glen Canyon. It is thought that indigenous people have been entering and departing from this area for the past 9,000 years. The original inhabitants were hunter-gatherers, but later irrigation and small-scale farmers emerged. Many of the lush and delicately balanced side canyons were used to cultivate the typical crops of beans, squash, and maize. In the current day, protected reservations extend off the southern end of Glen Canyon National Recreation Area and the Navajo still have the most vital connections to the land and surrounding area. The ecological alterations in the Colorado River caused by the dam were one of the initial repercussions felt throughout the area by its native inhabitants. The new mass of water made it difficult for many families to obtain food and traverse routes in the manner that they had for centuries. Agricultural and herding practices had to be altered suddenly to account for the shifting environment. Countless generations of history and archaeology were submerged beneath the new lake. During early surveying of the area, U.S. government representatives held negotiations with local tribal leaders, and promises were made to offset these issues, but many of these deals went unfulfilled, and subsequent pleas went unanswered. Navajo elder and historian Wally Brown tells the story. And they were brought to the river what is near now present-day Page, Arizona, and the uh, government official asked the Navajo leaders, they said, how much of that water do you want? 
and all of them agreed we want half of it. Since the boundaries of the Navajo Nation and the other lands and that, it was always divided by the middle of the river. So we want half of that water always. And so there was no question. So they told them, they said, but when we put a dam to this river, it's going to back up. And we want you to uh, understand that uh, a certain amount of water will be allocated to the Navajo Nation. And so the leader said, we want half of it, which would be 50%. But also that the, when the dam is put in, the, the waters will back up on thousands of acres of our land. And so we want to have some compensation for that as well. So we would like to have an additional 3% of that water. And without too much uh, discussion, the government officials agreed that 53% was reasonable. And so the young interpreter shared all this information and with the uh, Navajo leaders and the government officials. And uh, they were promised that when the dam was put in, all of the people would have water and they would have homes uh, if, if they moved out of the canyons. And that they would also be able to have many fields, that they could have corn, squash, and beans, and whatever crop that they wanted to build. One of the most notable blows was the Glen Canyon Dam's impact on the revered Rainbow Bridge. The Rainbow Bridge is an incredibly massive natural arch rising over 290 feet and spanning 275 feet clear across the entire Colorado. Historically, Rainbow Bridge was very remote and rarely visited by non-natives. It received recognition as a national monument on May 30, 1910 by President William Taft, but still rarely saw any visitors for the next 50 years, as it was still a three-day trip by boat and hike back then. That changed when the dam was constructed a few years later and the canyon flooded. There was then simple and practical access to the monument due to the higher water and boating access. Navajo Nation long held this landmark and surrounding area sacred, and could only watch helplessly as the new lake rose closer and closer, making access, tourism, and abuse easier and easier. In 1974, members of the tribe filed suit against the Secretary of the Interior, the Bureau of Reclamation, and the National Park Service, on account of their religious sites being inundated by the rising waters. The court ruled against the Navajo, saying that the need for water storage outweighed their concerns. It wouldn't be until almost 20 years later, in 1993, that the NPS finalized a management plan for the area, involving public input and consultation from the local tribes of the Navajo, Hopi, Paiute, and White Mesa Ute. This was just one example of how the new reclamation project affected the Navajo, but the displacement of tribes to pave the way for the lake still continues to adversely affect them even to this day. It should also be noted that the indigenous tribes were previously completely left out of the river compact negotiations of 1922, which divided up the river usage between the states. This essentially left them with no legal claim or lifeline to the precious water that had always traditionally passed through their lands. Keep in mind, this was long before the broken promises and problems of Lake Powell compounded 40 years later, making things even worse. Steps were only very recently completed that would temporarily secure drinking water for Navajo Nation from the shrieking Lake Powell that they were originally promised part of. More on that in just a bit, but for now, let's look into the lake's current and future sustainability. At the start of 2023 in February, Lake Powell's water level sits around 3,522 feet above sea level, dropping nearly 180 feet since 1980 when it was full pool at 3,700 feet, and the rate of decline has been accelerating. Several factors have contributed to this, including the ongoing drought period of the last few decades and overuse and abuse downstream. This has currently left Lake Powell at about 23% full and only about 30 feet from the minimum deadpool level needed to generate electricity at the dam. Besides the overuse downstream and issues presented by nature, adding to these problems as discussed earlier is the soft, porous sandstone that holds Lake Powell. Unlike the Hoover Dam, whose foundation was set into more hard and durable volcanic rock, the sedimentary sandstone of Glen Canyon is much more permeable and allows water to seep into the ground and back into the water table in effect partly negating the only job of the reservoir, which is to contain the water it receives. Between 1963 and 1969, it was estimated as much as 655,000 acre feet seeped back into the sandstone each year. Conversely, some of this seepage does spring back into the reservoir when Lake Powell is low, 
but exactly how much of this water has potential to return to the reservoir and how much disappears into the ground and onto other regions is subject to debate. According to a 2013 study by hydrologist Thomas Myers for the Glen Canyon Institute, the reservoir continues to lose about 380,000 acre feet each year due to the leakage. Another problem created by the dam over time concerns the phenomenon known as siltation. Historically, all the sediment from the spring runoffs would be carried in the floodwaters down the Colorado and through the Grand Canyon, creating banks and sandbars lush with micro-ecosystems. Due to the engineering and placement of the dam piping, this silt is rapidly accumulating behind the reservoir now, falling to the bottom and collecting. The buildup of this sediment over time is estimated to render the whole project useless in about 100 years, as the lake floor slowly rises and reservoir capacity continually shrinks. Downstream, where the warm and muddy sediment-filled water would traditionally meander through the Grand Canyon to be deposited along its sweeping banks, the now cold and clean dam water has taken its place and changed the river ecosystem dramatically. Without new sediment, beaches are continually eroding and disappearing. The river water is in effect colder, fish populations are changing, and non-native species are invading. It is unclear if the experts back then could have predicted the butterfly effect we are seeing now, but many hope it's not too late to curb or reverse it. Groups such as the Glen Canyon Institute are currently advocating for the return of Glen Canyon to its original splendor due to several of the aforementioned reasons. Their Phil Mead First proposal aims to establish Lake Mead Reservoir as the primary water storage facility of the Main Stem Colorado River and would relegate Lake Powell as a secondary water storage facility to be used only when Lake Mead is full. I will put a link here and in the description if you would like to read their proposal. The GCI group certainly aren't the first to bring attention to the ill effects of flooding Glen Canyon, however, as the dam has been controversial for decades. In 1981, not even 20 years into the dam's service, the environmental group Earth First unfurled a 300-foot-long black plastic crack down the face of the dam in a show of guerrilla theater to exemplify their contempt of the structure. The Earth First Act did garner quite a bit of attention at the time, and though nothing much changed, it was essentially a continuation of the movement that had been there all along. Back to when conservationists like John Muir were fighting the damming up of Yosemite National Park. It is a movement that has continued to grow to this day. But many others would certainly not agree with this stance, and would argue that Glen Canyon Dam is essential now and for the future of the Southwest. One of the often cited reasons for the dam's current necessity is to provide hydropower to the surrounding area, especially the town of Page, which relies on it. Of course, it should be noted that the town of Page was built exclusively for the purpose of the Glen Canyon Dam construction, so right there you have a bit of a chicken and the egg situation. It should also be noted that the average annual value of Glen Canyon Dam's electricity represents less than one half percent of the electrical generation in the western grid, and the current grid could readily absorb the loss of hydropower from the dam including power in the town of Page. Looking a bit further back, however, we can see that at the time, the federal government justified construction of the dam not out of necessity, but to serve as a cash register of future funding and hydropower that would help them to continue projects in the growing Southwest for years to come, which it has. But it is once again unclear whether the bureaucrats and experts at the time had a clear idea of the totality of its consequences, though, or if they were overlooked in order to tame the land for the greater good and more federal funding. Whether you are on the side of preserving the dam and finding solutions elsewhere, or whether you advocate for a return to the natural landscape, the dam currently has some serious engineering issues that are threatening the water supply of millions. All the water that is required to completely supply cities from Phoenix to Las Vegas to Los Angeles to Tijuana is contained in Lake Powell and that water all makes its way through the dam's piping and down through the Colorado. The entire water distribution network for that part of the continent would be at jeopardy if the water could not pass through the piping at Glen Canyon, which is precisely the situation that water managers in the southwest are currently facing. The issue stems from the bypass outlet pipes originally installed in the Glen Canyon Dam as the reservoir now drops near Deadpool. At this level, water is too low to flow through the hydropower penstocks, and instead would have to be forced through the much smaller Riverworks outlet bypass pipes. These pipes were not intended to carry nearly as much water as the penstock pipes and would not be able to sustain the flow of the river, especially over time. 
A reliance on this piping to provide the needs of the lower basin would be catastrophic. If the dam were to remain in reliable service, these pipes would require an expensive refurbishment or replacement, and a solution to the siltation would ideally have to be tackled at the same time. The most robust and costly solutions often include some type of bypass installed near the foot of the dam, where sediment could pass by as needed and the river could still flow should water levels at Lake Powell become dire. As mentioned in our November 2022 update, the USBR was well aware of the outdated plumbing issue and was actively retaining water in Lake Powell to stave off Deadpool there, effectively shrinking Lake Mead further in order to buy time to work out a solution. The issue was finally officially addressed in February 2023 at a public meeting. Conservationists there argued that any solution to the dam's problems is around 10 years out. This is due to the lengthy environmental impact statement process. Add to that, drilling new holes lower in the dam carries the risk of damage to the dam and may not be a permanent fix as scientists today can't accurately predict in 10 years where the water level might be due to constantly changing climate. However, a set of alternative solutions presented to the USBR included plans like new intakes or a major investment in solar wind power production instead in order to offset the dam energy. This is an interesting article I'll leave a link to below, as we are watching the fate of the Glen Canyon Dam literally play out before our eyes. Glen Canyon Dam is no stranger to major repairs already, however. As mentioned earlier, the lower spillways that were constructed into the original diversion tunnels would require extensive repairs less than 20 years into the dam's service in 1983. The high pitch at the top of the spillways needed to join them to the existing lower diversion tunnels led to an unintended effect called cavitation. This is caused by the formation of small vapor bubbles within the accelerated water that eventually burst and send out shock waves. The cumulative effects of this can be devastating. Once cavitation started eating away at a single spot, it produced a ripple effect down the length of the spillway. By the time operations were halted and an inspection performed, the worst of their assessments were confirmed. A 30 to 40 foot hole was carved out of the spillway concrete from these small bubbles. Following the inspections, not only were costly repairs needed on the walls, but a new proactive solution had to be engineered, tested, and constructed in place. The ultimate result would be a new notch created in the spillway that would introduce air bubbles into the water before it had a chance to cavitate near the bottom. Many modern dams constructed afterwards now use this same engineering principle, but the lesson was an expensive one for this seemingly problematic dam, costing $37 million to complete. It can be noted, however, that during the 18 months of flooding events that ended up necessitating the repairs, the dam generated over $200 million running at full bore 24-7, in essence paying for its own maintenance. Keeping all this in mind, the new repairs that are currently needed certainly don't seem outside the realm of possibility, but perhaps resource managers should really stop and ask at what total costs other than money this time. Of course, besides hydropower and recreation, many local communities also rely on Lake Powell to supply their drinking and residential water, much like Las Vegas relies on Lake Mead. And much like Las Vegas, Amid growing concerns of drought and deadpool levels at the dam, the city of Page very recently commissioned a new water intake system to be built in order to pull water from the lower levels of the lake. The new intake system was completed in December of 2022 and was designed to supply water to the town of Page and parts of Navajo Nation even if water levels at Lake Powell dropped to deadpool. The project was funded by the city of Page itself, not the federal government, and was completed for an undisclosed sum. This new system was a contingency solution, however, and large-scale re-engineering by federal agency will still be needed, as discussed earlier, if the dam were to survive. But at least for now, these communities have secured themselves drinking water in the event of any worst-case scenarios that may come in the future. So what does an ideal solution look like to you? Perhaps you marvel at the landscape that has been impossibly harnessed for the greater good. Or perhaps you don't think we should have tried to reckon with nature's plan to begin with. Or maybe you agree with the concept of reclamation and retention, but think some things may have just run their course. Let us know in the comments below. Not only will you be helping our discussion here, but you may be part of the solution, as the USBR has continually sought public comment on these issues and is still trying to figure out the best ways to navigate the old river compact and how it relates to the current environmental challenges we are all facing. 
As always, thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next episode where we look further into what's behind the drought.